Okay, welcome to our repeated games lesson. So, up to this point in the course, which covered a lot of stuff, right? I mean, gone through a lot of lessons. Uh, we're, far, we're more than halfway through the course, but everything we've done has really been a one-time thing, right? A one-shot game called One Off in McCain. But a game that's been played once and only once. We have not studied games that are repeated. Which real life is full of games that are repeated over and over and over and over, even if you don't. Once again, a lot of these may not seem like games, but they are games, right? Whether to cooperate or defect might depend on the fact of whether a game is repeated many times. And if you know you're going to be playing the same game with somebody over and over and over, it might change what you do. So, we actually have two lessons on this. This one's called repeated games, right? This lesson. And really what this is is finitely ga repeated games, games that are repeated a finite or a definite amount of times. Um, this lesson's actually much shorter than the next one, which is indefinitely repeated games, which are games that are infinitely repeated or at least indefinitely repeated. They may not go on forever, but there is no known end point with certainty. Now, the repeat, the one-off games are not always appropriate. Sometimes they are, right? Sometimes a game happens once and only once, perfectly appropriate, but it's not always appropriate. In real life, though, many strategic interactions are repeated. There are many times when the interactions you would face happen more than one time. So, as mentioned, we're going to study finitely repeated games, games where we know there will be an end point, and we know what that end point is. Then we study infinitely or indefinitely repeated games. So finite, fin with a finitely repeated game, so we're going to see this lesson's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But we'll get to why that is in just a moment here. So we've got a prisoner's dilemma game. This is adapted from, from the book. So two people are going to go camping. There's a DVD player. Maybe you want to say Blu-ray player now, right? Um, the campsite. Each of them would gain four dollars of utility for each DVD rented, but the rental costs five dollars. Okay, got two people who are meeting to go camping. They don't communicate ahead of time. They could, um, they could rent or not rent, right? Could each they could rent a video or not rent a video? Well, the game is played once. What happens if they both rent? Right, pay off of three each. All right, you see where this comes from, right? They pay five. They get four from each each video that's rented. So two videos are rented, total payoff of eight. And but you gotta subtract the five dollar cost, so three value of three each. If neither rents, just a value of zero, um, if one rents and the other doesn't, the one who rents actually loses value because the rental costs five dollars, uh, only getting four dollars back in value, but the one who doesn't rent thinks this is awesome, right? Four dollars in value for nothing. So with this particular payoff matrix, what is, uh, what's the Nash equilibrium? Hmm, I'm hoping you can see pretty quickly, right? Camper A, four is better than three, zero is better than one, dominant strategy not to rent. The game is symmetric, so clearly we know that camper B, it's the same thing. Four is better than three, zero is better than negative one. Both not renting is the Nash equilibrium. Right? It's not Pareto efficient. So this is what, you know, we call it a social dilemma. We're not getting to the Pareto efficient outcome. If the game is repeated a finite number of times. So let's say they're going to go 10 times this summer. Right? 10 dates are set up. Should cooperation happen then? And this is it's an important question. And at first glance, yeah think, wow, if it's going to happen 10 times in a row, maybe cooperation could happen. Well, to solve these repeated games, what we use is backward induction. So we'll start at the very last game and move our way backwards to the front. Well, what's going to happen the last time they meet? Well, the last time they meet in round 10, they're not going to want to rent, right? We, we solved the one-off game, like the one-shot game, and we know that in the one-shot game, Neither party wants to rent in the last period. So what about the second to last period, the ninth out of the 10? Well, we know that if they're not renting in the 10th, 
the ninth is the last chance, right, where maybe the opponent would cooperate. But you know the opponent won't cooperate in the tenth, so going into the ninth, you wouldn't want to rent that DVD, right? Because you know in the tenth they're not going to, so there's no goodwill you build for the future. So in the ninth, you don't want to rent either, right? Because if you rent it in the ninth, um, you're just losing value. So both parties would come to the same conclusion and not want to rent in the ninth. So then they would look back, well, maybe the eighth is when I should rent. However, if we know that neither side is going to rent in the ninth period or the tenth period, why would either want to rent in the eighth? And in fact, you see that all the way back through backward induction. We could draw out um, a tree diagram, and it's not actually a bad exercise if you wanted to try this on your own. Draw out the tree diagram for this um, for 10 periods. Every single time you're going to find, uh, you're going to start at the bottom. Oh, I'm not rent, not rent is the Nash equilibrium. What about the period before? Well, it's still not rent, not rent. And that happens every single time. The question could come up, does this really make sense? Right? Is backward induction appropriately appropriate for a finitely repeated game? And I think that's a pretty legitimate question. Now, if you were meeting a friend 10 times, do you think this would be the outcome? I would sure think it wouldn't, but if you're meeting a friend, the payoff matrix is only capturing money. You probably value the friendship at more than the dollar loss that you would incur, even if your friend wouldn't bring it. And your friend, hopefully, if they're a friend, is the same thing. So the payoff matrix may not be right. If you're meeting a random stranger, though, up there, um, this very well could be the outcome, right? Or somebody you don't like. Right? We've talked about the value of spite, but somebody you don't like, do you really want to lose the dollar on them? You, you desperately don't want to lose that dollar on them. So if you were meeting a total stranger, it might be the outcome. But, you know, there are times where we talk, is backward induction really the right method? This might be one. Um, but backward induction doesn't get us to any outcome where we would say that we're going to get to cooperation. So when a social dilemma is repeated for a definite or finite number of times, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is for always for players to defect. So if you have a prisoner's dilemma type game, where they defect in one period, and you say, we're going to play it four times instead of one time. Will that change anything? No, it won't. They will, oh, they will still defect. They will defect every single time period. If it's repeated 37 times, what will happen? Well, we know 37 is a definite number. They will defect every single period. If you do it a thousand times, and you know it's going to be exactly a thousand times, right? the thousandth period they defect, which means they'd also defect the 999th and the 998th, and so on and so on and so on. When a social dilemma is repeated for a definite, finite number of times, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is indeed always for players to defect, just as in the original game. The tit-for-tat strategy, I'm going to mention it here, even though it really doesn't apply as much on a finitely repeated game, but it will come up a bit more for repeated, indefinitely repeated games. The tit-for-tat strategy, uh, I'm guessing you've heard of this just in general life context before, but in game theory this refers to a rule. You will choose a strategy um, to cooperate as long as your opponent cooperates, but then you will retaliate by defecting if your opponent defects. So if your opponent chooses to cooperate, you're going to keep cooperating. But if your opponent never chooses to defect the next period, you're going to punish them by defecting once. So that's the tit-for-tat strategy. If you wanted to say, if we impose the tit-for-tat strategy, is that going, could we get to a Nash equilibrium of cooperating in a finitely repeated game? And the answer is going to be no. If you don't cooperate in the short term, you're not going to cooperate in any of the periods. Folk theorem states that in a non-cooperatively repeated game, Nash equilibrium can be reached. That's Pareto efficient. This is not shown to be true for finitely repeated games. So, you know, so as we introduce this, um, I know one of the books says, and now for the bad news after going through this. So for a finitely repeated game, you don't get to the cooperation. You can't find... Uh, you're going to run into the social dilemmas. The good news is indefinitely repeated games are, uh, they do open up the opportunity for cooperation, so that's wonderful news. Um, the bad news for you, maybe, although I actually think this is kind of fun analysis, is it is a bit more complicated. It's one of the topics, uh, the next one that we'll be going into is just uh, one of the 
it's just a little bit more nuance in math than in a lot and some of the other things. So, but it's, it's a little bit more fun and it definitely leads to solutions we think are probably a little bit more realistic to the real world.